really think about how do you build out that digital footprint to be your best sales rep. And a digital footprint is not just, oh, we're going to go do digital ads. It's not just, this is our website, we're going to build out our website. It's really looking at from the perspective of where are your buyers and how do you get your content in front of them? So it feels like you're everywhere, even though you're not everywhere, you're just everywhere that they're going. Welcome to the Marketing Expedition Podcast, an auditory journey through the latest in marketing, branding, and advertising. Now, here's your Marketing Expedition Guide, Ray Allen. On this week's episode of the Marketing Expedition Podcast, I am speaking with Deanna Shimoda, and she's the CEO of Growth Mode Marketing. And she's made it her mission to know all that she can know about B2B marketing and demand generation. She stays on top of all the tech trends and social media, and while she stakes on the cutting edge of marketing innovation, Deanna stays grounded in a foundation of solid marketing principles. She's used her skills and expertise to catapult multiple technology companies into high growth mode. Now, she leads growth mode marketing with the goal to help other organizations travel down the same path of success. We're going to talk about all kinds of things and understand exactly what demand generation and content marketing and having all the sales alignment and what that means. So stay tuned for that. But first, it's time for our Marketing Essentials Moment, the basics that you need to continue to help you build your brand and your bottom line. Today's topic is we want to talk about social activation and why we want to go beyond just likes in our social media likes and follows, right? We want to be able to activate to get our social media followers to be more than just voyeurs, but we want them to be participants and ultimately become evangelists of our brands. So activation, social activation really can occur when your fans and followers will directly participate in the activities that you lay out for them to participate in such as contests or coupon redemption, uh, photo and experience sharing, the things that we want them to do and act on rather than just view our content, right? We want them to do something with it and share it and get it out there. And we want people to, the especially the people that we want to attract to our brands that could potentially then buy from us, we want them to be engaged. And so that way we capture their attention. We get them involved with our brand. They get to be a part of the whole brand experience and talk about us and share their their satisfaction with using the brand that you are putting out there in the world. We want them to endorse us. We want them to help accelerate word of mouth advertising, right? We all know that word of mouth advertising is the number one way to get our brand activated. So if we can do things where we can create our brand advocates or our brand evangelists, it will help us to drive our revenue, drive our sales, drive social activation with other customers that are in their sphere of influence. And if we can get them to do reviews and recommendations and all the things that we can do to get them to do more because they want to, not because we're trying to push it down to where they, you know, we're, we're pulling on them to get them to do it. It's because they want to, and you can create content that can allow them the ability to want to be a part of that experience and then share it with others. So some things that you can think about doing is some polls, or maybe it's a special coupon that you can send to them via email, or maybe you can say, hey, share uh, the experience with this on social media, do some shout outs um, in, in ways that you can get them to want to participate in that social activation and set up a whole strategy and a plan so it's going to take multiple ways to go about doing that because it's sometimes people will want to be participating in a coupon. Sometimes people could care less about coupons, right? Maybe it's a contest that is engaging them and you can then capture their email and their other contact information throughout the whole process. So then you have multiple ways to engage with them and then reward them for doing it. If they're going to continue to be your brand advocate, we want to reward them with all kinds of things that are going to be beneficial and of value to them. Maybe you give them something of a, a freebie that you could give to them because they've done something so awesome for you to talk about your brand, right? So show your customers 
how you can not just deliver on the product or service that you do, but the experience. And on your social channels, it's not all about just pushing your products or service and you know trying to sell, sell, sell. It's more about sharing the story, the unique point of view that they have, or maybe sharing their story about their interaction with your brand experience. What can you do to offer something of that to them that they're going to want to return that favor to you? It's reciprocal, right? So those are some things that you can do to continue to build your brand and your bottom line. But let's get into the interview with Deanna. Welcome to the Marketing Expedition Podcast. I'm your host, Ray Allen. I'm the president and CEO of Pepper Shock Media and the founder of the Marketing Expedition Community. And today's guest, we have Deanna Shimota. I forgot to ask your last name. Did I say that right? <laughs> you did. Shimota is correct. Excellent. <laughs> I got your first name. I forgot to ask. <laughs> and all the way from St. Paul, Minnesota. <laughs> I have to say it right. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Deanna. And uh, just give us a little background kind of, of, you know, where, how you got to where you are now and what you're doing and, and the ways that uh, kind of built up to what you're uh, working on now. Yeah. So my background is in marketing. I actually went to college for marketing and worked my whole professional career in the marketing field on the corporate side. And then about nearly eight years ago, I decided to take a step back from the corporate side and start Growth Mode Marketing, which is a demand generation agency that helps B2B organizations break through the clutter of crowded markets so that they can crush their revenue targets. Because I saw that as a challenge that I had as a VP of marketing at a startup software company that was private equity backed, had a major mission to achieve high growth and trying to navigate and figure that out. We felt like there just wasn't an agency out there that really understood, okay, we're focused on growth. We're not focused on the brand experience that a lot of agencies were trying to sell. Wow. Well, you can certainly crush your elevator pitch there. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, that was good. I, so when I, when I teach my students, um, I teach uh, uh, marketing as an adjunct at Boise State, and they all have to come up with their elevator pitch, and then they have to memorize it and practice it in front of people. And uh, it's been fun because they this was the last of the kind of the pan pandemic generation, right? And some of them had yeah. never actually been in front of people when we were in the classroom. So it was really fun to get them to do their elevator pitch. But <laughs> anyway, I love I love the, all the iterations of what you said, right? Those are <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, you know, it's not like I just one day was like, this is how we're going to talk about ourselves. From a marketing standpoint, it's a process. And even when we work with our clients, it's like you iterate and you test and you see what works until you land on an elevator pitch that actually is clear and to the point and resonates with people. Yep. I totally understand exactly what you do and I love it. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Deanna, tell us more exactly what it means to do demand generation. Like what, it, what it, by definition, by your definition, just so that way people listening have a real full understanding of what it means exactly to do what you do. Yeah, that's a great question because I think there are a lot of marketers out there that think the term demand generation is interchangeable with lead generation, and it's really not. And so people are interpreting it all different ways in the way that I interpret it. And, you know, my team at Growth Mode Marketing interprets it is if you look at lead generation, that's the more traditional model that for the past 20 plus years, companies, especially in the software space, have been running with. And with that, you're focusing on your marketing programs to capture the 5% of companies that are currently in market and you're asking prospects for a meeting. So essentially, you're trying to pull them into your sales process. On the flip side, demand generation is about focusing on driving value, not just with that 5% currently in the market, but also the 95% who are not looking to buy right now. So your marketing programs are really focused on building brand awareness and trust to create the demand and ultimately capture it. Because the thought is eventually those other 95% of companies in your total addressable market probably at some point maybe in market to buy. And today's buyers are spending up to 80% of that decision process, doing their own research, talking to people, 
um, finding information without actually engaging with the vendor and talking to a sales rep. So you've got to win them over and, and basically sell them on your services and your products well before they're in market. And so from a demand generation standpoint, prospects are asking you for a meeting and they're inviting you into their buying process versus the flip with lead generation where you're trying to pull them into your sales process and you're asking them for a meeting. Yeah. And sometimes it's like pulling teeth <laughs> to get yeah. people to want to buy. Yeah, for sure. I love that though, because it, you, it just opens up the market even more and you're educating people on why they need you versus trying to, you know, expl- convince them <laughs> and, you know, plead with you and do business with you. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the reality is you can't convince somebody to buy your enterprise level software for half a million dollars if they're not already in market to buy. And anybody that's worked in marketing on the B2B side for high ticket items knows what happens. You know, sales gets behind on their revenue numbers. They're panicking. They're coming to marketing and they're like, help drive some leads quickly. But again, you can't convince people who aren't in market to buy. So if you haven't been doing those demand generation programs to create that brand awareness, you're not going to capture the people that actually are in market because they've already established that brand awareness and trust with different brands. So think of maybe a a successful client story and how you were able to do just what you do for them. I think about, you know, and you don't have to name names if you don't want, but if you could kind of walk us through the process of when they came to you, what did they do? How did you work with them? How did you make this demand generation and, and how did you grow them? Yeah, so we have a whole process that we look at that has three pillars when we're talking about building out a demand generation engine. And so when a client comes in the door, you know, sometimes they're starting at different points. But if we're starting from the get go, we're going to look at the three pillars, which are strategy, content, and distribution. And so that strategy piece, that's really about building the direction and the blueprint of everything else you're going to do. And so we start with an ideal customer profile. That's about identifying who are the best fit companies to purchase your services. Because I think a big mistake that a lot of organizations make is they try to be everything to everyone. And it's very common to go and look at it and say, we are selling this widget that anybody could buy. It, you know, and, and from our perspective, we're looking at it from a, a B2B company standpoint. But even if you apply that to the consumer market, same thing. Um, there are riches and niches is a saying in the B2B space, because it's like if you're, let's say, an HR technology company and you're going out and you're like, we are going to sell our um, human capital management system to HR leaders. Okay. Every company that has an HR leader then is technically in your total addressable market. But it's a very, very competitive space. There are over 21,000 HR technology solutions across the globe, and they're all competing for the same dollars. So, you know, if you put it in the perspective of I can go and I can market to all of the companies this applies to, or I could say, you know what, we're going to focus on manufacturing. We're going to demonstrate that we understand the unique needs of hiring and managing a workforce that has shift differentials, that has high turnover, and all of those elements that might play into a manufacturing workforce. And we're going to market to them and talk about it. Well, let's say there's 20 human capital management companies marketing to that HR leader at that manufacturing company, but only one of them talks about manufacturing which one do you think is going to stand out, right? So that's where the ideal customer profile comes into play. It's like, how do you narrow down your audience to actually get better traction? And that can help you create that catalyst for growth. Then we look at the unique point of view. And that is really like a story to challenge thinking in the market. Because if your product does not have truly meaningful differentiators to the competition, in the eyes of the buyer, you've got to find a way to position yourself so that you still stand out. And then of course, developing that content marketing and demand generation plan. So all of those three things, that's what we call the strategy. That's the blueprint that sets the direction to hyper-focus the next two pillars, which is the content and the distribution. 
And the content, you know, that's pretty self-explanatory. The content is the fuel of the demand generation engine. So we're looking at what are the key topics? Are we creating content for every stage of the funnel? Are we creating what we call cornerstone and cobblestone content, which are cornerstones are big meaty pieces and cobblestones are like the bite sized pieces that you chip off of that cornerstone to create even more content. So different formats because people consume content differently. Some people like to go deep. Some people just want bite sized chunks of that information fed to them over time. And then the distribution is really how do you get that content out there? So when we're working with a client, there are three avenues from a distribution standpoint. First is your website. That's your digital storefront. So they've got to be able to, if I'm a buyer and I'm coming to your website, I want to be able to dig in deep and find information and and really like wrap my arms around what it is you do and why it would be beneficial to me. The second avenue is managed channels. And that's really those channels where you can control what is put out and when, and you build an audience. So that's looking at things like podcasts, webinars, blog articles, social media, email campaigns, ABM campaigns, all of that type of stuff. And then that third avenue is third-party channels. So while you're building up your own audience of people that continually want to consume your content... How do you tap into existing relevant audiences that are already out there to expand that reach? And all of this together, you know, the way that we kind of explain it to clients is you are working to build out your digital footprint to become your best sales rep because you know that 72% of B2B buyers do not want to talk to a sales rep They go through up to 80% of that purchase decision process before they're even willing to raise their hand to talk to that sales rep. And it's, it's allegedly taking up to, on average, 66 touches before they will pay attention to a company and and take notice and start to engage with them. So that digital footprint, when we say it needs to become your best sales rep, it's not replacing your sales rep, obviously, but it's helping bring buyers to a point where they're ready to talk to a sales rep. It's teeing it up for the sales rep to then even get to be able to talk to somebody that might even want to buy from them. Yeah. And I'm guilty of that too. Like I will look online for everything before I want to talk to somebody and, you know, because then I'm like, I feel like I'm going to get hounded and ah, and yeah, so it's true. (laughs) Yeah, it it really is. (laughs) I know. And it's like, I, I know better to do that because I, you know, obviously I'm in marketing, so it's on the flip side. I, you know, only reach and break through, but you're right. 66 times. Wow. That's, that's, mm-hmm. uh, that's a lot now. I mean, it used to be like, what, 12? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, <it's laughs> yeah. Just- and it, yeah, the 66. So the statistics I'm throwing out, these are all from Gartner, you know, a well-established firm in the tech space that uh, does a lot of research. And so when they say 66 touches, That's the average. So you got to figure there are individuals and companies out there that take 200 touches. And then there's some that might take 20 touches. So yeah, it's the job as a marketer and a sales professional is getting harder and harder, I think. Yeah, it does seem like it is. And everyone said during the pandemic, double down on digital. And, you know, like you said, your footprint, your your best sales. I love how you phrase that because it's true. We need to keep doing it in tandem. I mean, there's definitely a space and place for the salespeople to to be able to use what has been done in marketing and they need to work together and and come up that way, right? So do you have maybe maybe some specifics of kind of how and what you did for a client that kind of call out some tactics that you may have taken to implement some of the different stages of your, you know, the pillars that you're kind of building through. Maybe just give some tactical examples that come to mind when I say that. Yeah. So, you know, we're doing a lot of this in different phases of this whole process with most of our clients. And so, you know, when I think of some of the things that we commonly do, uh, you know, like we have a client in the Fortune 500 space that they wanted to build out their digital footprint specifically at the brand awareness stage. So the top of the funnel. 
So we've developed a comprehensive, you know, we call it a media program, but really it's how do you tap into that third party audience? And we're working with those media outlets on the client's behalf to do things like place them as podcast guests, to create articles that are um, written by basically industry influencers, but the client is giving them the information, you know, and kind of giving that perspective of this wasn't written by our company. Someone else wrote about us and look how great what they said about us is. Um, they're doing webinars with these media vendors, they're getting their email lists and they're doing email blast to kind of drive them to the content that is being created by the third party vendors. So there's just a whole mix of things that are being done on that front. Another example, um, you know, we got clients who do podcasts and with the podcast, like we'll look at a podcast as a cornerstone piece of content, which is that meaty piece of content and how do you turn a podcast episode into 20 pieces of content? And that sounds kind of extreme, but when you actually break it down and, and do the math and realize how small some of the bites are, you actually can get there pretty easily. Because let's say, you know, you record a podcast and you do both video and audio. Well, now you have the audio recording and you have the video recording that you can post on your site and on YouTube. Then we're going to create like social media clips of the videos. So one to two minute kind of edited key points from it to put out there. So let's say you get three to five of those clips from the episode and you create an article or two from the conversation. You create, let's say, five to ten social media posts just on comments and you can create visuals and graphics and stuff that go with that. And so you can see how you start to sweat the content or slice and dice it to get more content and more leverage out of those things. So those are really common things that we do. Um, I would say something that right now we're seeing a lot of requests for on the client side is developing the unique point of view story framework. And with that unique point of view, as I touched on before, it's like, how do you stand out in the market when you don't actually stand out from a product differentiation standpoint and helping organizations kind of think through like, what is the story we're going to go out there and tell over and over and over and consistently in order to make our mark and stick with our message with people, you know, and the way we coach people on that is it's not going to be this message that everyone should agree with. Because if they agree with it, it's not a unique point of view. So it's something that challenges status quo. And you're going to have some people who are like, I don't agree with that. And some people who do agree. And the people who do agree, they're the ones you want to attract as your clients. You know, So it's, it's developed with your ideal customer profile in mind. But just building out that story, like how do we talk about this? How do we make it part of our identity so that we can get some traction with clients and prospects? Right. Yeah. I think uh, if you can keep keep it consistent, that is going to help too. And then another thing that you talked about is webinars. And, you know, during the pandemic, I mean, that's what we did is webinars and webinars, but I'm still seeing some keep with it and stick with it. It still seems to be one way to create that demand generation? I don't know. You, you tell me what kind of are you seeing trending with webinars now? Yeah. You know, I think there are two sides of the coin. There are those who say webinars still are a really important factor on the B2B side. And there are some who are like, webinars are dead. It's time to move on to other things. I think webinars absolutely work in some cases, and they don't in others. It's really about your ideal customer profile and where did those people go for information? And if, you know, you're talking to them and you're finding, you know what, this crowd doesn't do webinars. They don't have the patience to sit through 30, 45, 60 minutes of content. We need to do something else. But if you find that they are doing it, I think, you know, Having a captive audience that's willing to give you that amount of time is a really beneficial opportunity if you're 
presenting really good content to them to create that brand awareness and build that trust with them. So I don't think webinars are dead, but I do think you've got to know where your audience hangs out and where and how they're consuming information. And that should drive the type of tactics that you're doing in marketing. Yeah. I mean, it's half the battle is getting people to show up to the webinar and then having them stick through it and stay there. And then, you know, having some sort of offer at the end so that they, you know, want to listen through the whole thing. And yeah, you know, I definitely, we've played a lot with webinars over the years, just trying to figure out, you know, what works, what doesn't. And it just, it it evolves. Right. (laughs) And it continues to evolve. It it does evolve, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm still a proponent of webinars, but I'm totally guilty of anytime I see a webinar that I, the topic is of interest to me, I will register for it. And I'll think I'm not going to attend the live event. They'll send me the recording. (laughs) <laughs> Nine out of 10 times, I never get to listening to the recording, you know, <laughs> and so it's like, well, I am clearly not the right audience for the webinar, because I can't commit to, you know, watching the 30 minute webinar after I signed up for it. But I think it's still, you know, valuable to that organization that's putting it out because now they know I was interested in the topic and they've collected my information and they can put me in nurture campaigns that put that kind of content regularly in front of me and hope that maybe I'll bite onto the smaller consumable content. Yeah, I think that's that at least has some value even if they if you don't watch the whole thing or I, I love it when people say, oh, I missed your webinar. Can you send me the recording? And then I know yeah. immediately, like, oh, okay, they're really actually interested and they're probably more likely to actually watch it if they're asking for it. Yeah, that's right. helpful. <laughs> but not always. I don't know. You're right. It's kind of a love-hate relationship, I suppose. And you just never know. <laughs> <laughs> and now a message about one of our sponsors, Nadine West, which is awesome, affordable outfits that are delivered to your doorstep each month or however often you want it delivered. And each month features surprising new outfits that consist of items perfectly styled just for you. And you only keep what you love and then send the rest back free of charge. I absolutely love it. The things that they send me, I often keep more than not. And so for our listeners, if you sign up today using my link, you'll get $10 credit and free shipping on your first order. So go to peppershock.com slash offers and sign up for Nadine West and get your $10 credit. I know you're going to love what Nadine West sends to you. I even get a personal message from her asking how everything's going. Anyway, so go to peppershock.com slash offers and sign up for Nadine West. There's all kinds of AI tools now. And are you, are you implementing any AI tools in your agency? So we haven't, you know, I've looked at this, I've talked to a lot of other agency owners who are looking at this, you know, I'm I'm trying to figure out like, are there ways to use the AI technology, like for example, chat, chat GPT, without ruining the authenticity of the work that we do for our organization. So, you know, I'm not one that believes you should start writing your copy from chat GPT. My mind's not there yet because I'm like, anybody can go get that. It doesn't sound original. It's not authentic. But I think there's, as I think through ways that our agency can use it, you know, for example, this morning, my team was talking about, oh, we need to build out a list of like industry influencers and media outlets and options for a client program that wants to target the CFO in an organization. So I went to chat GPT and I was like, I'm just going to say, what are the top 100 US based publications for CFOs and pull some information in that way to kind of help us with research. It hasn't been this, Oh my God, this is amazing. Let's, let's use this for everything type of experience, but we've definitely been testing it and trying to figure out, are there ways to help us do our job more quickly and efficiently without doing our jobs for us, if that makes sense. Yeah, I definitely know that it it takes HI, human intelligence, to use AI. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. You have to ask the right questions. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And then even when you do have it spit out something, you've got to, you know, make it your your voice and your information, not to make it just so generic that it's, you know, definitely you can tell that it's AI generated versus 
HI generated, right? And I mean, right. I think there's definitely some of those tools that are useful. Like I use Grammarly because my grammar, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I want to know that <laughs> you know, have something intelligent go out. But I also, yeah. I've used it where it's good for SEO. Like I was struggling coming up with a really great headline and byline. And so I, I type in what I wanted and, and then, you know, give me, give me options for a headline and give me alternative options. And what ended up happening is I kind of, I saw the options it gave me. I went back to my original option and I tweaked a few words only because it gave me some ideas but I didn't end yeah. up using anything that the, you know, the, <laughs> the AI gave me. So, I mean, if anything, it's maybe there to support and, you know, use some for research. But but it's been proven, though, that even the stuff that it spits out is not always 100% accurate either. So right. you can't believe everything <laughs> you read, right? And, and you have to fact check stuff. And from an academic side, um, it's interesting because now students have access to this and they can write essays and, you know, write their papers or whatever. But I got smart and said, okay, I want you to journal about the experience that we had in class today. And there's not a single chat GPT that's going to be able to write about the experience that we had <laughs> in class today. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I know it opens up a whole can of worms on what people can do when you have this tool that can write stuff for you, you know, <laughs> and I, I think I, I've seen a lot of, you know, kind of comments on LinkedIn about using AI and tools like chat GPT to help write sales emails, prospect outreach, things like that. What I would say to that is if you're an individual, like an a uh, SDR, for example, and you're not a good writer, you're probably going to get better email content out of chat GPT than you can write yourself. But if you are a good writer, you're going to get crappier stuff than what you can write yourself. So, you know, it depends on what you're using it for, what your skill level is. Can it help you improve on things or not? You know, and I, I think the reality is a couple years ago, I saw a presentation to marketing agency owners where they're like, you need to embrace AI. This is coming, figure out how to use it. And I was sitting back and I'm like, eh, this is not applicable to me. <laughs> like, I don't know how this will ever replace some of the things we're doing. And now I recognize, you know, fast forward a couple of years, I'm like, okay, this probably is going to have an impact in some way on the things we do. Like, maybe you do use these tools to figure out, uh, meta descriptions and keyword research and stuff like that versus going and doing that manually as a human. And instead as, you know, agency employees, we're taking that information and then we're figuring out how to fact check it and, and make sure it's accurate and take it to the next step. Yeah. It's good for idea generation and, you know, that's good. And I mean, for my students, it's like, listen, we're going to embrace it. You're going to learn how to use it because when you get into the real world, <laughs> people will be using it. So I want to make sure that you're prepared for it, but I also want yeah. you to have some critical thinking skills on your own and, you know, think of things that have and you know, <laughs> make sure you generate ideas on your own too. Right. I mean, it's in tandem. It's right. kind of like another tool in your toolbox. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So let's kind of change gears just a little bit. I want to kind of talk a little bit more about you and your agency and, you know, kind of some things that you go through with, with your agency. How, how long have you had your agency now, Deanna? Uh, we've been in existence almost eight years now. Eight years? Yep. Oh, congratulations. That's awesome. You, you. you made it past the seven year itch, like they say. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we did. Yeah. And then how about how many people do you have on your team? So we have about 10 people that are on our team. Um, we also work with a pool of freelancers for, you know, in, in the agency world, um, the work, like there's peaks and valleys. And so that's how we manage some of those peaks is bringing in extra help. I understand that. And sometimes there are people that are just like you said, niches make riches that have very specific talents that you can you yeah. know, pull together and work together for sure. Yeah. Are you 100% remote or are you kind of hybrid? Yeah, we're actually 100% remote. So we um, 
before COVID hit, we were actually always remote. I had a business partner and, you know, at the beginning it was just the two of us. So, you know, naturally we were going to work out of our homes. And over the years, as we've hired more people, we always hired them as remote employees, even though they're all based in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. So they're all, you know, close Mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. Um, We actually thought about adding an office as more of a crash pad than uh, you have to come into the office right before (laughs) COVID. And then COVID hit. And we were thankful we didn't have an office space. And, you know, now that we've gotten through that and and people are going back to offices and stuff, um, I don't know if we'll ever have an actual office because prior to this, you know, we thought, do we need an office? Like, do clients care? Do they want to come to our office? And now so many companies and our clients even are remote that they could care less whether an office exists or not. So... Yeah, it's just it's interesting how work works these days, you know, how things are happening. And, and we have an office, but I'm like, you know, we have maybe one or two people that come to the office out of the, you know, time <laughs> we have to. And and it's, you know, kind of hit and miss. We're, we're at least all there one day a week now. That's what we've kind of, okay. re, re, you know, evolved to. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> right. it's kind of, you know, and we can have freelancers from all over the country and we do, right? Yeah people from all over and it it is it's an interesting time to see you know if if office space and and people want to continue to work from home or not and some people they want to have that office they want to come to work they don't want to work from home and you know so it just kind of depends on the person really and what they're doing and collaboration and creativity sometimes it can be hindered or it can be helped right there's kind of two sides of that for sure. Absolutely. And I think, you know, having started remote from the get go, like we figured out how to work together, how to, you know, function as an agency, how to be creative and collaborate together. But I saw a lot of companies really struggling when COVID first came around and everybody had to shut down and they had no choice but to figure out how to work remote. And they were like, we can't do this. They were kind of trying to micromanage, like we're going to have meetings with the entire team twice a day, check in, how do I know if they're doing things? And it's like, okay, one, not everybody is meant to work remote because to your point, Ray, you know, there are absolutely people who don't want to work remote. And then there are the people who don't understand that working remote you still have a job, you still have expectations, you don't get to, you know, pop in and out and not do your job. But, you know, as you build out an organization, and you look at that, if you're going to be all remote, you just have to hire people that fit that model. Yeah, and understand, you know, how to do it, because not everybody can. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's true. So in that kind of line, what is what do you think the biggest challenge right now is with with our agencies or you know your agency? What are some things that you're faced with thinking about either overcoming or like that you see a challenge or maybe an opportunity? Like what's what's kind of in the future, near future for you? Yeah, you know, what I see on a day-to-day basis is like a big mistake that companies are making, you know, that as an agency, we can help them with is so many companies focus on the short game. And that's lead generation, because they're like, we need leads now. We're short on revenue, we have to uncover them, let's run with it. And in that focusing only on the short game, they become really reactive They start to do what I would call random acts of marketing, meaning they're doing this and this and this, but there's no real strategy or focus behind it. And they're overlooking the long game, which is that demand generation. And, you know, those future prospects are important to future growth. So, you know, we've seen that as an opportunity. We actually, you know, if you were to talk to me nine to six months ago, I would have told you we were a full service B2B marketing agency. We're not a full service B2B marketing agency anymore because it goes down to that trying to be everything to everyone. And it's really hard to be really good at something when you're trying to do all the pieces. So we saw the opportunity from a demand generation standpoint to refocus ourselves to support clients in a way that helps them focus on that long game. Because I think so many companies get stuck in that we need leads now. And lead generation just is not 
working the way that it used to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, it's just all about how to find the right iteration that's going to work and continue to work <laughs> and then iterate it again and yeah. it even better. Right. You are absolutely right. The challenge that we're facing is where people get scared because they're losing revenue. And so they're just, like you said, random acts of marketing and just mm -hmm. trying anything and everything as a, you know, oh, maybe this will work or maybe that will work. Well, maybe just stop and pause for a minute and, and think about the strategy and the plan and, you know, work the plan and, and not try to be that scared marketer that's out there trying to just, right. you know, win and lose out of it all. <laughs> Right. You know, and as as marketers, we've all been there. <laughs> we've all had those moments of pack, panic where it's like the company isn't producing the results it needs to. The marketing programs aren't delivering what I had anticipated they would. Crap. <laughs> you know, what do we do? But yeah, you have to you have to take a step back and look at the big picture. And, you know, by no means am I saying if, if your company is behind on revenue, should you just abandon any efforts to find short-term leads, but it's not a strategy that is effective from a long-term standpoint because you're constantly chasing your tail and not making enough progress. Yeah. Being proactive instead of reactive. <laughs> That's a good idea. Exactly. Um, okay. Let's talk about some other things. What, what do you do to stay on top of things in, in the industry? What kind of resources or podcasts do you listen to or what do you mm -hmm. do to, to stay on top? So I have gotten really into podcasts lately, which is hilarious because I was one of those people who was like, I don't get podcasts, you know, <laughs> and I hear that they're popular. And then, you know, a couple of years ago, it started to click with me like, hey, I'm getting ready for work in the morning, standing in front of the bathroom mirror. This is a great opportunity to turn on a podcast and listen, you know, and it's more, uh, I can multitask versus trying to read a business book. So I've I listened to a lot of podcasts around B2B marketing, demand generation, um, ABM or account-based marketing. So there's no one I religiously follow. I listen to a lot of different ones and they pick up a lot of good information from them. I've also found like if you follow the right people on LinkedIn, there's some really good tips and conversations that get passed around that people are putting out there. And I feel like it's really broadened my thinking around not just demand generation and lead generation, but the challenges in marketing and how you need to think about it. And I've been able to turn around and go have conversations with my team and think about the services we offer and test them out with clients and really kind of refine who we are as a marketing agency. Oh, okay. And speaking of podcasts, you have your own. I do. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the podcast um, put on by Growth Mode Marketing is called The Demand Gen Fix. And it's on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, basically anywhere that you would find a podcast. And our team talks a lot about demand generation and how to build out an engine and kind of some of the pitfalls from a marketing standpoint that you can run into that we commonly see organizations make the mistake of doing. Oh, good. I'll have to go check it out for sure. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, Deanna, is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience today that uh, you that I didn't ask you about so far that... Uh, <laughs> Something that they could walk away or, or you know, listen to and, and say, oh, yeah, that's great. I need to I need to know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, we covered a lot today. So I, yeah. I feel like, you know, we left no stones unturned. But my parting words for your audience would be as you think about your marketing programs and how buyers are buying today to really think about how do you build out that digital footprint to be your best sales rep. And a digital footprint is not just, oh, we're going to go do digital ads. It's not just, this is our website. We're going to build out our website. It's really looking at from the perspective of where are your buyers and how do you get your content in front of them? So it feels like you're everywhere, even though you're not everywhere. You're just everywhere that they're going and looking for stuff. That's good. And being there before they even get there or even know that they need you. <laughs> That's good. Right. That's good. Exactly. 
Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Deanna. I really appreciate your time today and sharing all the wonderful nuggets that you had to drop. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, Ray. Yeah. And for those of you listening, the best thing that you can do is share this with those you know that need to hear what Deanna had to say today. And the other thing that you could do for us is give us a a review and help us share this with others by doing that because it ranks us higher with all the wonderful reviews that we're getting. And I'm going to start doing some shout outs. So uh, give us a review and I'll shout you out on the show and we'll um, get you on the show as well. So thank you so much. And for everybody listening, until next time, enjoy the marketing journey. Thanks for listening to the Marketing Expedition Podcast. Want to continue the journey? Don't miss out on new episodes. Subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. Wouldn't it be great if there was one place you can go to get all the latest information and tips about marketing and advertising? The Marketing Expedition community is that place. People like you gather in our online community to build relationships with others and find the latest marketing trends, tactics, tools, and technology. We help you build your brand and your bottom line. Start your adventure today. Visit themarketingexpedition.com to find out more.